you, Kevin. So good evening to everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. And uh, thanks very much, Kevin, for inviting me to talk about myself, basically. Welcome. Um, so as Kevin said, I, I arrived in Malta in September 2016 as a, a lecturer at MCAST, where I'm teaching on the photography course there. Uh, but Malta is actually my fifth country now of living and working. Um, I'm London, England born, um, but I left about 30 years ago now. And I spent a long time in Paris uh, before moving to India for several years, to Nepal for some more years, and then eventually ending up here uh, in Malta. My first career is not as a photographer at all. I'm a, I'm a clinical ph pharmacologist, a research scientist, and I worked in medical research in the pharmaceutical industry for a while, uh, principally for the company called Sanofi, which many of you may know. And the major area that I worked on was ALS, which I know in Malta you are all very well aware of. So this evening, I, I wanted to, rather than talk necessarily about photographs themselves, but talk about some of the stories behind photographs. I'm a photojournalist, documentary photographer, um, and I had reasons for doing that. And this is what I want to talk about a little bit. So I hope to show many things. What's it like being a photojournalist? What does it really involve? What, what actually happens to you, if you like? But also showing what I like to think of the beauty of photography. It's given me so much in my life and it's taken me to places that I never thought I would ever get to. Um, and basically, I have, I have many favourite images because they're good photos. But the ones that I often remember the most are the ones with the stories behind. And some of them you might see later on in the presentation. Some of them can be quite banal, I mean, just very ordinary looking images, nothing spectacular. But it's, it's those stories that trigger. Now, I have to warn you a little bit before that there are some images which you might find a little shocking because they're important images to the job that I do or the job that I have done and they're reality. It's what the job entails. So I think they're important to talk about and they have important stories behind them. Okay. So if I start with this first image, which you should be able to see on the screen, which is the one that was up on the, uh, the social media profile advertising this event. This is, to, this is very much about what I enjoy about photography. Um, it's an image that it took me to places where I thought I would never get to. So this is in South Africa. This is outside Johannesburg in the, in the countryside. And these two people in the image are uh, farmers. They, they work as apple pickers on a farm. And the actual story behind the image is about tuberculosis. I have done a lot of work on what we would call public health in the developing world, which is why I have lived in the various places I have and I've done a lot of work for the United Nations, a lot for World Health Organization, for example. And this was a project about tuberculosis in South Africa. And the story was about this couple and their daughter who unfortunately contracted TB. But the reason why I like this image, it's one of my favorite images, is it's all about the couple that I met, if you like. The, the, I literally turned up that day. They had no idea who I was. Why should they let me in and take photographs of them? But they did. They welcomed me. They made me tea. We, before even taking pictures, we sat down for a while, talked about what we wanted to do, why I was there, and made me feel very, very much at home. And I think part that's part of part of being a photojournalist is being able to fit into these situations. I just need to flick back two images. So this is me. This is um, in Zambia. And I was working there on a project for the UN. And this is the typical downtime when I'm not taking pictures, interacting with the people I'm working with or who I'm photographing. And this is an image that I like. It sums up quite well what it was like being in the field. I have another image of me, which this one. It's the same sort of image of working in the field. This is in Botswana. But it's an image personally that I absolutely hate. And the reason is, it's the story behind this picture is that it's the mother who is actually taking the picture of me. It's her child who I'm with, who has malaria. And she wanted a picture of you know, this man who's come a long way. He's a foreigner, a picture of, of, of him with my child. But I think the I think the uh, the expression on the child's face says it all in many ways. Just, you know, what am I doing here? But also it's an image I don't like because 
it looks very much to me like the white man coming to save Africa. And that's not at all what my work was about. And, and I, I like to show it because it, 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 it can show how photos can be misinterpreted. You know, we can misread images. I have a very particular view of this, but when I've shown this to other people, they think it's a lovely image, whereas I don't. Okay. So if I flick, so if I go back to the beginning of why did I become a photojournalist? Why did I leave my very, very safe and secure, well-paid job in the pharmaceutical industry to go and become a basically a poor photojournalist? Um, and it's all about curiosity. I'm somebody who wants to know about the world. Why, are we, why does the world work the way it does? And I felt photography was a way for me to do that. But also in this particular instance, this is uh, a lady who has ALS. I was working on Rilutec, this drug for ALS. But I'd never met anybody with ALS. I didn't know anybody with ALS. And I was researching this new drug and, and I found that quite unusual, a bit strange. And so I started by doing a story on ALS. Uh, I worked with associations over a couple of years and I photographed a day in the life. And this particular image I chose because the story behind it is that even though Tony and Simone, the couple in the image, had a home help, they had uh, NHS care and everything else, he was very possessive of his wife. He knew how to look after her. Nobody else did. And even though the nurse came, he wouldn't let her touch his wife. And it taught me a lot about care in the home, care in these situations. I'd never been exposed to a situation like this before. And it was a, it was a way of me for me of, of learning in many ways. And over the years that I photographed, I photographed three families with ALS. I learned a lot. And it was one of the reasons why I realized why photojournalism was something for me. Mm -hmm. When you uh, are not just a photojournalist, but a photographer anywhere, sometimes you become the actual subject of the photo without being in it. And what I mean by that is this image. <clears throat> so this is in um, Zambia. And this is uh, an orphanage for HIV kids, HIV orphans. And when I was going there to do the work, I was introduced to the teacher and said, yes, you know, come to the classroom, come and work. But unbeknown to me, they had prepared for me to come. So as I walked in, all the kids got up and started singing. But they were singing for me. And after that, of course, it was almost impossible to get c control of the classroom back to do some images that I wanted to do because th the kids just wanted to be with me. And it's in these sorts of situations where it's quite difficult sometimes because you're there to do a job, but you're the actual subject of the work that's being done. Um, and you have to make these decisions on, on the hoof, if you like, of well, how am I going to get around this? Or do I just let, just let this go, not take pictures, but I'll just let's play with the kids. And so sometimes you just you never know what's going to be in front of you when you arrive in these situations. And one of the things about being in photojournalism, you have to think on your feet all the time. You never know what's going to happen. And you'll see from several images what I'm talking about. So here, this was another situation where I was surprised. This is in South Africa, in Cape Town. And these older ladies are dancing and singing and rehearsing a song for going to the school and talking about HIV prevention for kids in the school. And it's their way of getting the message across through song. So I photographed them singing. Then afterwards, we sat down, had a cup of tea. And the lady, I think if you can see my cursor, this lady here, 80-year-old grandmother, who was sitting next to me when I was having my cup of tea, turned to me and said, now, young man, are you married? I said, no, no, I'm not married. She said, do you have a girlfriend? I said, yes, yes, I do. She said, now, young man, tell me, you, you use condoms, don't you? You're very safe in what you do. And all the other old ladies started chiming in and quizzing me about my sex life if you like with my girlfriend I, you know, are you safe and everything felt like being grilled by my grandmother and this is one of the things i love it's you're thrown into these situations and it, it can be hilarious at times they were such fantastically funny people and, and, and such lovely people to be with this is a, another story of uh, hiv infection 
This is in Botswana. And I worked with this young girl called Connie. And I was writing a story on her as well. And I, thought, I was with her for a couple of days. And we were photographing around. This is at her niece's house. And at the, at the end of the interviews, and I was writing up the story, she asked me and said, look, please, can you write in your story that I'm young, I'm single, I'm available, you know, I'd like to have a boyfriend. Can you sort of, you know, do a bit of advertising for me? Can you please, please write that in your story? And it's very difficult sometimes because you parachute into people's lives. I, I only spent maybe a couple of days, but you can start to feel like you form relationships, but then, then you're gone and they're left behind. It can be quite emotionally um, a challenge in many ways, if you like. When I was living in India, I met this young girl called Babli. And when I was a kid growing up, one of the things I was always fascinated with was surgery. I don't know why. One of those twisted things that you have in your minds, probably. But I loved watching surgery on TV. And I always wanted to, at some point in my life, get into the operating theatre and you know, be there. And it just so happened that this young girl was uh, under, going to undergo heart surgery, open heart surgery. She had a hole in the heart. And I thought it would make a good story. And I asked around, contacted all the right people, and eventually got permission to do the story. But it was an, it was an interesting experience. I, I got where I wanted to go, and I wanted to see surgery. But whilst I was in the operating theatre, this is where your background can sometimes be a little bit of a hindrance or not help you if you see what I mean and I'll explain in a moment. So this was her before and this was her after three days after the operation. I follow the story from the very beginning to the end there are there's a whole set of, of images of this but what I wanted to show you and, and this is an image that is graphic next obviously because it's surgery so either I hope you've eaten or you'll be okay and you might you'll be able to eat afterwards but feel free to look away if you need to. But when I was with the surgeons in the operating theatre, because they knew about my background from the pharmaceutical industry, my medical science, they decided to include me on their level as a fellow medical person. So every time they were doing things in the operating theatre, they were pushing me to photograph and say, you need, this is a very important step, you must do this, do this. And for this particular image, for example, I was photographing, but from a bit more of a distance. And the surgeon was behind me, pushing me forwards, pushing my head forwards. No, 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 you've got to get in. You've got to get in, get really in close. It's a very, very strange feeling being shoved into this sort of situation. But the, the, the funniest thing for me in many ways was this operating theatre was quite small. And, you know, this is the heart of that little girl. So I knew her and, and, and could see this heart. But she was on a heart bypass lung machine. And I was much more worried about tripping over all the cables and the tubes and like unplugging her. This was that was my biggest worry when I was doing this piece of work. But this is a, a girl who this is in 2004, so 15, 16 years ago now. But I've seen her regularly since whenever I've been back in India. And she's a, a girl that I, I still photograph. The other fantastic thing about photography, certainly in the job that I've been doing, you get to meet famous people. A camera is one of those passports that can take you to places that other people can't necessarily get to. And I've had many experiences uh, in this way, and, and they did, they've been amazing. And one particular one was with Desmond Tutu. And I was working in Malawi on a project in pneumonia in children for the Bill Gates Foundation, actually. And I was following him around. We were doing clinic visits and, and photographing. And you know what they say sometimes, you know, you should never meet your heroes because they aren't exactly what you sometimes think they may be. But he was. He was an amazing man. Um, this image was quite interesting because the, I had been in this room the day before and there was no blankets. It was bare. It was as it was normally on the days when it's working. But it had been completely and utterly revamped for his visit. And I told him this afterwards and said, you know, you do realise it, it wasn't like this. And he's like, yes, I know, I know, I know. But, you know, I have to play my game. I have to do my thing. But I don't have the images to show you, but I, I've been in the right situation at the right time with a camera to photograph the Dalai Lama, 
who's somebody I'd always wanted to have met. I was very lucky in, in Cuba at one time being in the right place at the right time to get to photograph Fidel Castro and many others that I would never have had this opportunity if I hadn't had a camera and I'd been a photographer. It's, it's, one, of the, it's the, one of the beauties of this profession, I think. These images are, this next series of images are about difficult situations that you may face as a photojournalist, things that have really been tough or I've had to make certain decisions. And they're images that when you look at them, they remind you of, of, of certain things. And this is a, a situation where you never, you never know what's going to happen in the sense of what are you, how are you going to react? So this is a, in Bangladesh, in Dakar, in the capital, in what's called the rag pickers. And this was about drug users and HIV. And we were walking down the street and bear in mind that it, you can see the image in front of you. I am you know, Mr. White Man walking down the street. It's, a, it's very obvious I'm not from there. I have a camera with me. I, I'm with somebody from an NGO as well, but you, you do stand out whether you like it or not. And this guy just literally jumped out in front of me, rolled up his sleeve and grabbed a needle and injected himself and then told me to take a photograph and started shouting and screaming to take a photograph. And you find yourself in that situation of, well, what do I do now? If I say no, what's going to happen? If I say yes, is he going to then want to copy? What, what is actually going to happen? And in this particular decision, you can see the result of what I actually decided to do. I, I took the picture and we moved on. But these are situations in, in photojournalism where you just you have to be on your feet. You have to really be aware. Uh, almost 360 degree, uh, 360 degree uh, vision. Another situation of what I would consider danger, and sometimes you, you ask yourself, you know, is this picture really worth the danger that I have to go into? Should I really do this? And this is, it looks like a, a banal image if you like, but this is tuberculosis in uh, Bangladesh. But it's not just TB, this is what we call multi-drug resistant TB, which is almost a death sentence. And I, needless to say, I didn't spend very long in here. I put a mask on, I arranged the people on the bed, I took a couple of pictures and then I was gone. But you're, this was as a commission from the United Nations, from World Health Organization. So you know that you're there to get certain images and to do the job. But you, you find yourself sometimes weighing up this situation of, you know, is, is it really worth it? Am I, should I really be doing this? Am I, is my health worth actually doing these, these, these questions that you, you ask yourself. This particular image, again, might not look much, but this is where, you know, that famous saying of, you know, the camera never lies. But of course, the answer to that is the camera never lies is the biggest lie of all, because a camera can lie very easily, or it can't necessarily show everything. And you'll see that in a couple of other images. This is a place called Falkland Road in India, in Bombay. Um, it's a very famous part of the red light district. And you can just see uh, here in the windows here, this is what are called the cages where the sex workers work. And this is probably one of the times I've felt the most scared doing the job that I've done and the job that I do. I was on my own this particular time at night in this road. You stand out. It's obvious that you're not from there. And I was trying to get some images, but I started shooting a little bit from the hip, but it was very hostile, very hostile. And I, I eventually left, but it's one of those situations where I'm not sure I really would do again. It made me question, okay, what are your limits? You know, the, the photography challenges you in many ways. It's not just taking pictures, but it's going to get the pictures. What will you do? How far will you go? Strange situations, situations where sometimes you feel a bit or you feel very out of place and, you know, you ask yourself, should I be here? Is this, is, is this really what I should be doing? So this is a brothel in Bangladesh. And this is basically the top floor of a hotel. And I was with this lady that you can see in the image who's holding the, the, the drawing, from, she's from an NGO, um, who took me there. 
but you walk in as a man into a room of 20, 30 sex workers, and then you're supposed to take pictures of them. It's a very strange feeling. It's, it's a very, and, and it's, again, for a while, it's, there's, you're pausing and it's, well, what am I going to do here? What am I going to do? I'm really, I'm really not sure. And all the time around you, work carries on. So whilst I'm there working in this room, girls are disappearing because clients are coming. Then they're coming back. It's a working environment. They don't just stop for me because I turn up. You have to fit in. It was going well until we went downstairs where all the pimps were. So these guys had two or three of the girls that you saw upstairs. And it got very, um, what's the word I'm looking for, tense. And it was one of those situations where you have to make that decision of, now, are we going to still be safe or do we need to go? And we had to go. There was the, you have to make those decisions that uh, I may have missed some pictures. There might have been some good images there, but actually it's time to go. Those pictures, maybe I'll get them again sometime, but they're not going to happen this time. And you, you have to let them go. So this is what I would call difficult images in the sense of difficult to take and difficult that they've made me ask many questions about myself and why I took them at the time. Would I do them again? You know, what, is, what is this all about? What, what is the job all about? This is in my very early days when my first sort of year or so of being a photojournalist. And I was very much, you know, I, I read the books, I looked at other work and was very much that, you know, it's important that these images get done. This is, this is what the job is. This, this is what I thought. So... I was in South Africa, um, and again, this is this is tuberculosis, and a patient died in the hospital, and I thought that this is a story about you know t people die from TB. It's not just they get treated, but they do die. So I thought I had to photograph it, and I asked for permission, and I got the permission, and I photographed. But now, 15, 16, 17 years later, uh, I don't know. I wouldn't do it again. It's it's something that I I, I wouldn't do, and I, and I. I, I use these images, obviously, when I present and when I teach and everything, and, and I constantly ask myself the same questions. And also I ask the question, and maybe for yourselves to think about, is do we need to still see these images? Are there not enough of these images already around? If I show this to friends in Africa, their immediate reaction is, well, what about all the good things in Africa? Why are you just showing this? A very good question. Same with this image. This is this was in um, Malawi, and this was a feeding station. There was an area of famine, and I was again had my photojournalism head on, if you like, of I should be photographing this. This is something important, and I did. I went and got permission to go and photograph, but I really found it difficult, partly because the mothers started posing the children for me. They would sit them down on the mat, put them in positions, make sure they were sitting up straight, and then ask me to take photographs. And I just couldn't do it. I found it very distressing. And after this, this is an image that I hardly ever look at. I only ever use it for presentations because it makes me think of these things and, and it makes me question who I am as a human being. And also that whole thing again of have we not, you know, it's this whole poverty disaster porn, as we call it. Have we not seen enough of this already? And do I really need to contribute any more? And I still haven't answered those questions. I have lots of views, but they still haunt me, if you like, to this day. I will, I'm mindful of the time. Um, but this is, it's a very ordinary image in many ways and doesn't look particularly special in any way. But I think... For me, in terms of my life as a photojournalist, it's one of the most, it's the saddest picture I think I've ever taken. In the sense of, uh, it's just the bewilderment of this father and daughter. She was a, a young girl who was HIV positive, had come to the clinic, had uh, secondary infections, come with her father who was a fisherman. This is in Papua in Indonesia, on the border of Papua New Guinea. And 
they had no idea what was happening. The doctor gave the father this big, big wadge of medication for her, which is in his bag that you can't see there. But he was, they were just completely and utterly bewildered. And I just, for me, it was the situation of, I'm going to go home to my nice, comfortable home and my nice, comfortable life that I have. But I'm leaving behind this poor father and daughter who have no idea what's hit them. No idea what they had no idea what HIV was and the potential that well, his daughter's unfortunately going to pass away. And again, it's one of those images that just triggers so much because of the story behind it. But you can't see that in the picture. And it's again this whole idea of you know the difficulty see I often have with photography and the way it, that it describes very poorly things that we want to show, and it doesn't do what it it says on the ticket, if you like. I have one last image, which is one that sticks with me because of the experience, and it's it's a bit of a it's what I call my dystopian nightmare. Um, and this was a project. This is the pneumonia project back in Malawi, and I was working with this nurse, and we were in the room diagnosing this child for pneumonia. But what you can't see is what's going on behind me, where I'm sitting which unfortunately is a situation where a young, a young teenage girl was dying of malaria. And whilst this mother and child and the nurse were just happily getting on with their consultation, behind was pandemonium trying to save the life of this child. And I couldn't, at the beginning, see it because I was photographing this. And then I could hear it. The child unfortunately died. The mother... Everything was just like living in a complete and utter nightmare. And I had no idea what to do. I was completely lost at that point as to, do I walk out? Do I take, do I carry on taking pictures? And it was the nurse who finally, who basically just turned to me and said, um, yeah, what a shame, such a waste of life. And that blew my mind. And I had to leave at that point. I couldn't stay in the room any longer. Oops, sorry, wrong way. I'm going to skip that image. Fun. But, or, no more doom and gloom. This, again, is where you are part of the picture. This was working with the gay community in India, in Bombay. And again, an HIV story. And it was their party on a Friday night. And they had prepared a dance for me. They knew I was coming. And it was all about, you know, you have to photograph or, photograph us. You're, you're, you're taken over by this whole situation. You're part of it, whether you like it or not. You can't be the fly on the wall anymore. And this was all for me, this dance. And I had to be there. I had to join in. I had to be attentive. And But it was great fun. It was great fun. But sometimes you end up not doing what you want to do because you're taken over by the others. This particular story is one that has stayed with me forever. And I worked with this group of transgender in Indonesia. This is in Jakarta, in Indonesia. And they're called the Warriors in Indonesia. And I went to meet them. And this, again, was a story about HIV and working peer intervention in the NGOs and going out and uh, helping their community. And at this particular uh, NGO center, there was a clinic, a, what we call a drop-in clinic, free clinic for them to go and get checked up. And I met the doctor, and the doctor was very adamant that, you know, you must come and photograph me. You must photograph me because, you know, it's important that we look after the health and we, we must do these things. And I said, okay, fine, fine, fine. And she said, uh, okay, so you wait here. I'll go and set the room up, and then I'll call you in when, when we're ready. And I said, fine. So she came and called me and said, yes, come, 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 and you, you know, we, we need to do this picture. And when I walked into the room, this young lady here was lying on the examining couch with her trousers around her ankles and her bottom pointing towards me and standing next to her was the doctor holding a swab telling me that this is a very important procedure you need to photograph this it's very important that we check the patient it's very important that we do these anal swabs so you know you have to photograph this and there was a quite a long pregnant pause of that situation again of 
do I really want to do this? Am I really going to do this? And these things are all going around my head. And, and I know this is an image that, yeah, okay, it might be important within the medical world and all this, but really, should I be actually photographing this? And I politely declined. And we got over the issue of she was a bit upset because, you know, this is very important, but I just couldn't, I, I couldn't do this. And this is where you have to be very, uh, what's the word? You have to be good at talking, good at persuading and good at being gentle and letting people down. A week later, in, in the same, this is in, in Indonesia again, a week later in the same place, I was working with female sex workers, and this is another drop-in clinic, and a very similar situation happened. And the doctor came to see me and said, you must come and photograph, you must come and photograph, because, you know, we do we do free checkups, it's sponsored by the World, uh, the World Bank, the Global Fund, you know, it's, it, we need all these. Okay. This time... Uh, when she invited, the doctor invited me into the room, it was all set up for a gynecological examination. And the doctor was standing there holding a speculum, saying, right, we need to uh, we need to do this. You need to photograph this, it's very important. And I looked at her with this speculum in her hand and I'm like, are you really going to now drag me over and tell me to put my camera to photograph this? Is this, or is this just a dream? Am I actually really not getting this? And I had to politely decline again because I didn't want to ask the question even, is this serious Are you, or are we just going to set this up? I just had deja vu all over again. And I just, I had to run away. I politely declined. So I, I think there's other pictures I need to do now. But you end up in these situations which can be amusing. Now, I know I'm at half an hour, Kevin, so whether you want me to stop or not, just tell me. Uh, yes, maybe you can uh, stop a bit and let's see about questions. Okay. No problem. Is there, is there? Are there any questions from? Just put, Pilkas, just put on your mics, guys. Okay. I hope I haven't put anybody off. <laughs> no, I mean these things are. Uh, you have to show. I mean that's your job as photojournalist. Yeah. Uh, hello, hello, Stone and Sopa here. Hello. Okay, Tom, go ahead, Tom. Uh, you must agree, I think, that uh, the first especially part, they were very sad images, right? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. wh what is your biggest satisfaction in doing in doing this? What, the what biggest... Is... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. The biggest satisfaction, the reason I did it, if you like, is because I thought that I could contribute to the awareness, contribute to uh, fundraising, contribute to better care, better treatment, because I, I wasn't just working as a photojournalist on my own going and do the images, I was working with the United Nations, I was working a lot with the World Health Organization, with UNICEF, with all these um, these groups that I thought, okay, so they have money, they do a lot, they, they use the images in certain ways, so many of the images that you see uh, are used and have been used for like uh, reports on the diseases, for example. Um, if you if you go on Google, you'll find me. You'll find lots of reports. So I had a sense of these images are actually serving a purpose. Now, if my image, if I was just going on my own and not say commissioned, and I didn't know if I was going to get published, and I didn't know if my images were going to work or not not be used, that would be a very different feeling. That would be a problem for me if I if I felt that I was just because then you 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 run in or you fall into that trap of are you just being a voyeur is this all about voyeurism and your own personal trip of wanting to go to see these situations but as long as i had that anchor that there is a purpose to this that's what kept me going it's also one of the reasons why when i finished the talk if you like i actually haven't done this work for a while i i, I stopped there are there are some reasons for that and it comes back to a little bit about what you're saying Okay, thank you. Okay, they, you got your message across. I, I, I can agree about that. They yeah. do, they, you did your work very, in a very good, Gary. Prosit. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, do, do you want a five minute break, Gary? I'm fine. I can carry on. You're fine, Mala. Move on. And then on. we can questions maybe afterwards. Okay, thank you very much. Move on. Yeah. Then. Okay. Thanks. I'll, I'll carry on. So, 
this was a situation in um, Vietnam. I was in, in Hanoi, in North Vietnam. Again, this was for uh, tuberculosis and the World Health Organization. And I was taken to the National Center for Tuberculosis in Hanoi. And the director of the hospital uh, welcomed me and it was explained what I needed to do. And he said, okay, no problem, come with me. And he took me to one of the wards. And it's not a ward like we imagine. This is like a room with you know, a few hundred people or more, all on beds like this, just rows and rows of beds. And he basically stopped everybody from talking and then just started talking to all the people there saying, right, this man is a photographer. He's come from a very long way. He's a famous international photographer. He needs to take pictures of tuberculosis. He needs to take pictures of all of you. You must do whatever he says, whatever he wants, give it to him, okay? And then he left. And he left me on my own in the room. There was a nurse with me who was who was translating, but he just, he, he, he just left me. So all of a sudden I found myself with all of these people staring at me, expecting something to happen, expecting need to take our photos, right, we're all ready, so if you go, if I'm just going to take a photograph of every single one of them. I don't know if you've been in situations like that where you suddenly feel overwhelmed that, oh my God, everybody's looking at me, it's all about me, what am I going to do? Are they just going to all start walking towards me and start expecting me to do? It was a little bit overwhelming. The way that I overcame it was I, I started in one part of the room. I just talked to the nurse and said, look, I can't I photograph everybody. I can do this and this and this. So if we go into this corner, can we start here and then sort of work our way around and see where it takes us? But can you just tell everybody that I can't take everybody's picture? Can you just sort of re-explain a little bit? But sometimes you get completely dropped in it. And again, it's about thinking on your feet. It tests you all the time. It's one of the things I do like, that sort of challenge, having to work your way out. So this is um, in Nepal, and I. one of the things I haven't asked the question yet, actually, is mo the images that you've seen, there are, uh, there's a, a mix of digital and film. And I'm just wondering if people have recognized the difference between the two. I'm not going to give it away, but there's a, there's a, there's a fair old mix in there. Anyway, this is in uh, Nepal on the Indian border. And I was working again with another transgender group and I, I was doing a series of portraits. And this is the final image. But what I want to show you is how this image came about, because uh, it was it was a fun situation again in the sense of I had been to meet the group the day before and asked if I could come and take pictures. And they said, yes, no problem, no problem. Come tomorrow morning and we'll, we'll set it all up for you. I arrived the next morning to find the office of this group converted to a changing room and about 20 or more transgender all getting dressed up for me and I had no idea this was going to happen and basically they were they were almost they were dressing up for a fashion show and it turned into a street fashion shoot which had not been planned at all and one of the problems I had is that as you can see from this image I was working with a large format camera and my dark slides were loaded but I only had 20 images that was it you can see a dark, one of the dark slides here. Uh, after 20 images, that's all I had. I hadn't gone prepared for anything else. So, and there were like more than 20 of them for portraits. And in my head, I had to start really thinking about, right, how am I going to do this? You can see in this image that I'm not alone. The village was sent word that there's this man, this, 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 this white man, this international man with a big camera in the street. We all have to go and have a look. We all have to go and see what's going on. The other thing from this image, what is missing is normally with large format, we have, you know, the black cloth over our heads. But this is what you can't see in this image, I don't think, is, you know, this is 40 degree heat in the monsoon and the humidity. And that black cloth over your head is just impossible. I tried it for a few shots and it was just ridiculous. So I, I abandoned it. Uh, but that's the front image. The behind image is this. So this is all the guys who are in the dressing room behind here. Everybody's dressing and they're all waiting in this heat and humidity waiting for me. This guy decided he was going to be my assistant and took over. It's fine by me. This guy was crowd control. As the crowds were getting bigger and bigger, the village was going. 
it's a complete and utter cacophony of just everything going on and the mental stress of it because can you imagine working with a large format in this situation uh it's if you're if you have your your nice digital slr you can fire away no problem just change your memory card this is about changing film all of those mechanical operations of a large format is quite challenging putting yourself in these situations but it was a great atmosphere it was great fun we had a really good laugh this is a, this isn't me um this is a it's, it's just a little story of how you can sort of like close the circles of friendship within the photography group and, and all the rest of it so this is a friend uh, a friend of mine very very good friend chip an american photojournalist who worked for the gamma agency and this is actually um tiananmen square in 1989 you know the very famous um the famous demonstrations in tiananmen square chip was there and he would tell me stories about this i do love his sort of pose in front of a burning tank it does make me laugh and very much him but he would tell me stories about this and i had an assignment to go to china and i i was determined to get to tiananmen square i wanted to go to sort of close that circle and be where he had been and and it intrigued me and so this is one of the images from there and it was quite an interesting experience you can just about see from this image that there are very few westerners there there are very very few um and whilst i was walking around nobody would really speak to me except these young girls who were students would would walk past me but only out of the side of their mouth would they say do, do you speak english do you speak english would you like to come and talk with us in english would you like to come and talk and then would motion for me to go off because there's you know a lot of surveillance at tiananmen square so eventually i i because i had my camera with me this is done with my hasselblad and i gave one of the students the hasselblad to take a, a portrait of me with the girls and of course this is a great picture of a, of a, of how not to do a portrait isn't it with you know the red flag sticking out the top of my head but i've left it there because that's what it was like um but it was a, it was an interesting experience and i took this back to to chip and say you know here's tiananmen square can can you remember where this is because it's just in front of the, the muslim fascinating place china if anybody hasn't been I re thoroughly recommend and these are really the last images so i as i said to you before i lived in nepal i was in nepal for about 5 years in kathmandu and i was there just before i came to mcast so i was there in 2015 and i don't know if many of you remember but we had the earthquake in 2015 where nearly 10,000 people died around Kathmandu and and in Kathmandu and for me it was well you're a photojournalist this is what you should do you know you need to be out photographing the disaster um and i had resisted it up to a point because i i was questioning my whole you know do i is this what i really want to do I, am i comfortable with this i'm not sure do i really need to be adding to the thousands of pictures there's going to be of the earthquake but i was asked by this japanese ngo to go and photograph a relief program and i went to a, a village outside kathmandu which is where the earthquake was the worst and it just like a 3 hour drive to get up to this particular hill village and i started taking some images this and this so the house that you see there is the the only house that actually was left standing out of the 60 in the village everything else in the earthquake was destroyed and i i was taking some images but then i was there with a the relief operation and i just put my camera down and, and and felt that i was much more useful handing out relief and supplies and it, it was really what the the moment where i realized that i don't think this is really what i want to be doing anymore this particular photojournalism am i really this goes back to the question you asked earlier of am i really actually contributing anymore all my images getting to the places i need them to get to to be seen i really don't know and it was sowing the doubt in my mind of what use am i actually being there i'm really not sure about this and really these are the last images i've done of this sort of photojournalism if you like and then i just have one last story to finish with basically which is goes back to the whole idea of what photojournalism and photography has given to me in in terms of meeting some amazing fantastic people 
And I met this man very early on, Winston, Winston Zulu, Zambian. And I was introduced to him at a conference in Canada, actually, where I had an exhibition. And I got talking to him and he was there to represent Zambia for the fight against HIV. And Winston was HIV positive, same age as me. And we just hit it off straight away. We became very close friends. And it was his backstory as well that, that, that motivated me. But he was also just an incredibly charismatic man. And I did a story. We got it published. I managed to get it published in various places where he became well known. And he, he eventually was invited by Bill Clinton. He was at the United Nations to speak. He spoke to the, with Nelson Mandela. He became this really well known man. He was the first person to go public with his HIV status in Zambia in, in the 80s, which was you know, quite a dangerous thing at the time. Um, but I went to live with him for a month, six weeks at one point, and to do a story, to add to my story on him, if you like. And But it's more about who Winston was, the human being that he was, and what he taught me more than anything else. There was, he was my mentor in this whole minefield of working in public health and HIV and he just taught me so much and was a, um, just an incredible value, valuable human being to me and unfortunately he passed away a few years ago from TB but these particular images are just some of my, some something that's very memorable for me. Um, it's an experience I'll never have again perhaps but something I'm so so glad that I had and it was photography that gave it to me. Without photography, I probably would never have had something like this. And I just, I think photography is just such a fantastic thing. And I, that's where I'd really like to end it. Thanks very much. Okay, well, well done, um, Gary. As, as always, very interesting to the point and, uh, and uh, an honest account. Um, well, one thing I'd like to, one little story I'd like to add to your actual meeting of the two Chinese girls. <laughs> <laughs> Tiananmen Square. Actually, you just you escaped the scam there. <laughs> right. Yeah, because um, I've been there around three times, and uh, <laughs> my my Chinese guy that one time saw me talking to some girls who had approached me the same way, and she th she told me the idea is that they sort of try and get you to talk to them because they want to learn the language. Then they invite you over to have or something with them you know and then they where you go you're charged an, an enormous bill and if you don't pay it <laughs> you've had it <laughs> so <laughs> you just got to manage to get away with that to remind you of, of the mean, story think, anyway yeah i think luckily if they'd have asked me to go for a coffee or something that year starbucks had opened just off Tiananmen square so i probably would have gone there okay <laughs> luckily <laughs> you mean, it, 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 it might not have been there might they might have been genuine <laughs>